ready? Good. Good morning everybody. My name is Gwen Miller. I'm a lecturer at Genesa in the Department of Art and Music. Um, I'm a specialist in visual arts, a painter by training, and I also love drawing. Um, today we're going to speak mostly about painting and the very basic principles of colour mixture. So I'm going to take you through the colours. We're not going to do the colour theory, you've looked at that before. But we are going to look at colours and how they respond to each other and then I will paint an object as a demo in order for us to talk a bit about techniques, uh, application and use of the brushes, uh, etc. So first of all, colour is always intimidating for students. I have found um, in my time when I taught at high school that it is easier if you have pastels to introduce um, pastels to students first when you do colour because it's such a simple step between the, um, uh, the pencil which everybody is familiar with and the pastel stick. But moving from there, working with paint is often um, a quite a new experience for quite a few people. So when you start, work on, on very simple, cheap paper so that um, your learners can just have the experience of messing a bit, of discovering the paint, discovering the plasticity. Um, I'm going to just uh, have a blob of paint of the different colours. Um, and you can see I put my yellows together, I put my reds together and my blue. Um, at home when I paint I have many more colours but we are doing it with the limited colours that you work with. Um, when I work with oil paints I'm very aware of the fumes of turpentine so I always have a fan on and so if your, if your school works with, with oils so you have to make sure because it's actually really bad for um, the biology of the human being, um, the turpentine. So, um, and also when you start your painting, make sure your setup is comfortable. Make sure that you see your object in view of the space that you're going to work with. Your paints are all packed out. You understand where your different paints are. Um, I'm using a palette that is um, really lovely because it has little tear off sheets that I, I can just throw away when I'm finished and then I have a new palette. Um, personally, I find a palette like this very limiting. Okay, it's quite nice when you hold a palette, that's what the hole is for, you hold it like this um, and you can then obviously mix your colours on your, on your palette. Um, but when I work at home, um, I would often just have a large piece of, a piece of white paper with a glass over it. Um, that is fantastic because the glass is easy to move and I want a large surface. Um, another aspect that is nice to have is to have a container, um, you probably all know these little pallets, um, because if you know you're going to need a very specific grey, you can actually pre-mix it and have a whole blob of that grey sitting there waiting for you that you can work with. Um, I find these too small, at home I have uh, bigger containers, just separate containers. You also need to have at least two containers of water, one that you want to uh, rinse the, the dirty paint off. You need to have a nice wad of toilet paper or any, uh, even an old rag that you can dab your brush with. And then you, I have a tin with a little bit of clean water if I want to do a transparent layer. So I'm going to use the brush that I've already used. And I've just put out the three primary colours here. And we're going to start just with, with mixing, um, you know, to get that, uh, you know, your primaries and to get your secondary colour here. Um, and I want it quite a pure, so I'm going to leave that there and just take another brush and mix up that green, which is obviously the yellow and the, um, there you've got a beautiful green there, nice rich green, it's a nice transparent colour and then let's look, use another brush for the, for the purple mixture of red combined with your blue and you get a nice rich purple that's more magenta in a way. Um, the bluer it becomes, it moves away from that mauve towards a richer purple. 
in uh, paint colors, it's nice to talk about a purple lake. That's your purple you have there. You see, I, you sort of push and push until you find it. Okay, so um, in order to mix grays, we mix in between your, your secondary colors. Um, and to get that secondary color to become duller, duller, um, I would use a little bit of its complementary, which is opposite on the color wheel. And I'll, you can see there's a lovely glaze, but how it becomes a rich brownish color. So that is a better brown than a brown that just comes out of the tube. Now you can see when it's washed over the purple, it has a total different tone because this paper hasn't prepared. So it sucks into the paper, but it actually have a really nice brown quality there. And the brown that I'm going to get mixing this, oh, there's still some of that, but mixing an orange, let's mix it orange up again. When I mix, I like to use, uh, also leave a trail of, uh, as I mix, so that I can see how, I can remember how I got to this particular orange. So orange is complementary to blue, and if I mix some of this orange in the blue, I will also get a brownish color, a color, a gray color, and it has a slightly different uh, character to the gray that I'm getting from mixing the yellow and the blue. And these color grays are actually really important. Um, so this color gray, if my blue is just too bright, I will, for example, I could mix a bit of that color gray that I have here, just to get maybe a little bit more of an indigo blue. And you see when I do a transparent, it has quite a different quality than the blue that comes out of the tube. So it's important for painting that one discovers your own set of greys. Um, it's often seen as a weakness if only the colours out of the tube is being used. So um, let's use a bit of a green and a red to get the complementary grey from those two. My green has been used up quite a bit here. You see that was, I'm just going to take some yellow from there and mix that green in. So there I got my green again. And I want to mix this green, so I'm going to, so that you can see that transparency, push it out with a tiny bit of red, green and red are complementary to each other to see what uh, grey foundation I get here. And once again, very different kind of a grey. Let's leave that trail there so we can see how it moves. So I think before, before you, you ask a learner to paint an object, it's really important for the learner to mix about like this on a piece of cheap paper. There's no area you can really do and just play around to find. So I'm getting a gray or a brownish color that is in a whole range of greens up to quite a warm color on this side. Um, so that's a nice exploration of grays. And then the next step would be to play with what, what your um, white would do. So if I mix some of this with my gray here, um, my sort of my off-white I get is really lovely. Um, and if I mix, so we've got that grayish blue there, let's mix that with a bit of white to see what happens. And get a really nice cool gray. So that tint of blue and gray has that character. I'm going to put that brush there and let's take some of the greyish colours that we got with that orange, we just mix it in a little bit more and let's see if it, oh it's very warm, that's getting better. So you can also see there's medium on my brush, you know, you can't expect to make a painting if there's nothing on your brush, there must be stuff there. <laughs> it's only when you have stuff that you can push around that you can make the painting. So you can see how very different in character are these green, these three greys that I uh, achieved here from my prim primaries. And they started by having various steps in order to understand where, how can I develop this? And I actually have, it's really nice if learners explore and they just start with this exploration. So if I look at my object after this and I look at my greys here, I can see, ooh, this cool grey really picks up on that cool cloth that I put there and this warmer grey 
would possibly be nice for highlights that I have on the hat. Um, and then possibly these rich oranges, I can see it in the rust color of the hat there. Um, and in the darkness there, there's possibly some more of these purple grays that I see in that shadow. But just by doing this mixing and looking, you actually start understanding what you're going to do to paint that. It's sort of preparing your brain and getting your brain to understand how to take it from these things, this goo, this plastic material that's in a plastic tube to something that would look like that. Okay, so if we look at brushes, you can see I've been using the three brushes so that I can keep my colors. But if you look at your brushes, um, each brush also sort of evokes another feeling when you paint with it. Um, when you work with a round brush, round tip brush, um, it has one characteristic, you know, it, it, it maneuvers the paint in, in a different way. Um, and I love when I work with a round brush to also twirl it so that the paint, the brush becomes thoroughly, thoroughly thick with paint. Um, and then when you work with a, a flat brush, you can see it's cut at the top, there's different widths of them. The house paint brushes are often like that as well, and we would use that. It has, it's really good for flat, large surfaces, but the nice characteristic of this is that you can have that flat line, but I can also, let's get a bit of water to make it a bit more flowy, I can also have a thinner flowing line if I turn it on its side. So it has these two widths, and then if I work with a full bit, the full bit is cut around, it's tapered, a full bit gives me more possibilities to play with. So um, I'm just going to, to take a pure blue, saturate my brush. So if I work with my full bit, I tend to feel I have the freedom of sort of moving around more. And it really is about pushing the paint in different directions. Um, your brush doesn't just have to be in, in one direction. You can see I prefer often to work with my brush holding it like this because I get the extension out of this full arm. But um, you can use your brush like this and then you can get a very, very sharp, nice crisp line. You can add a bit of water there to make it flow a little bit better. And I can get a really crisp line or I can get that line or I can get this wide line. So my personal favorite is often a full bit. Okay, that is just. Now, working on um, paper is lovely, but it does absorb quite a bit of um, the liquid. A canvas, when you buy a canvas, like this canvas that I'm supplied with, um, the canvas, they say it's a prepared canvas, but if I rub my hand on it, we still have what we call tooth, because the, 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 the the canvas is stretched over a board and um, it, it's good because that's place where the paint actually sits in it but it does tend to suck up so much of your liquid and moisture in your paint that it becomes difficult to work on it. So what is nice is so here I've just rubbed in some, some uh, a little bit of this white. It's um, a very thin runny white and excuse me I like using my hand. <laughs> So even in preparing this, and because it's acrylic, it dries easily, um, you're welcome to use a brush. You don't have to be so bodily as I am. Um, but what I love about working with my hand, and I know acrylic I can easily wash off, is I can really feel the texture of how I manipulate this paint onto the surface and how thick it is. There's no question in my mind so I'm going to look at my object and just start looking at how is my object going to sit on here and which techniques I can use. I first have a single object, so I imagine I look at my hat again and I imagine the object could sit maybe here. I've deliberately put a cloth at a slight angle so that my picture plane can be divided. If you, I think one of the assignments asks you to, to group three objects. So the cloth is already one and you can decide if you want your cloth, for example, to be thicker or more complex, you can do that. So, but we're gonna keep it relatively simple today for the sake of, of having quite a short lesson and I'm breaking that line with a circle. Okay, so I'm going to start by mixing my grays. I've already got some nice grays here. 
and um, you can mix them on your palette as well. I will later on mix them on the palette a bit more. I'm going to start with quite a cool grey and I want to work with sort of the negative space of trying to feel where's the object going to be. And you can see I deliberately start I deliberately start with the, with the space and not the object. Um, and the lovely thing of your paint is you can, you can move and push it back. So I'm going to feel that hat. The hat feels like it sits there. And I like to have quite a bit of medium on my surface. And I see this line going from here to there. Let's see that angle, this angle. It feels right. I'm using my brush again to gauge the angle in relation to the to the surface of, of my paper. I'm just going to get a whole lot of that paint so we've got a nice surface to work with. So I'm going quite quick through my mixtures because I know my paint very well. Um, and I have spoken about the uh, I'm mixing a bit of a darker, richer grey here. Uh, and you'll see later on we'll tone it down. But I'm just... What is, one of the things that is really nice as one paints is to get what one calls a toned ground. Um, the Italians call it a imprimatura. So it is getting a ground that is not neutral. And um, it gives you that bit of freedom to, to do then have light and dark over that. So we're going to get some, see some dark qualities here. And you can see I use the full extent of getting a, a wider brush so I can quickly cover the back. Cezanne once said that it's like something rising out of mud if you do a painting. <laughs> and um, so I want to have quite a lot of white here. So I'm somehow going to put some on here. And I mix it with a better white. You just see that we get a light grey. I'm working with a cool grey here. And I'm actually mixing on here because I know I'm going to make a large surface. So just to cover that surface. And it's lovely and runny, the paint. It's, um, I don't know how to work with tiny blobs of paint. It's just, you know, I like to have it as medium. So I'm looking even there already on shadows falling in directions, trying to find that. Um, and there's a shadow there, but I'm not going to worry about too much. So I'm just going to leave it like that. It's going to dry in the meantime. Now I'm going to my hat. And I'm actually going to work with this brush. It's already got a, quite a bit of grays on it. Um, because I don't want that colour, I, I chose it specifically because this colour doesn't come out of these tubes. We have to mix it and that is one of your challenges. So I'm going to use quite a bit of red mixed with, with, your, with your yellows to get a warm tone that contrasts between, uh, with all these light tones. We can have some more of the lemon yellow which is a sharper, lighter yellow. It's interesting with these paints, you get pink and not orange. So, <laughs> uh, so you have to mix until you get something that is in between. So what I'm going to blob out first. You see, I, st I started actually without a drawing. I just started with flat surfaces, finding the space. And now I'm going to do like a negative shape of the hat. So the nice thing is I can play around and I can say, okay, I feel that side of the hat there. And I feel that top moving across and the roundness of the hat moving right around. I feel it goes over this edge and it moves into that area. So I'm going to flatten this area now, but I'm using this block to to start feeling where's the hat on this page and where is the directional shifts, linear qualities and how does this curve around, does it go further into there and I just block it in, that is like very very rough blocking it in to have the feeling of where the hat sets. Maybe it's a little bit more forward here and 
that comes in a little bit more. But I already have a space where I can feel light and dark. I can see my composition works with gray blues and orange. I have a, comp uh, a complementary color composition. And I have a sense of where my hat sits. Now I would like the specific form to move forward. So I'm going to start with my darker colors, moving in the shadows here, the shadows here, and the shadows there. So I'm going to start mixing something that's closer to um, the purple and quite a bit of reds. And what I don't like about what I'm mixing here is that this brush has the history of all this white and it comes out quite chalky. Now I can see maybe the chalky color could be used there. So I'll just brush stroke there to understand maybe there that possible um, and maybe it could be used here but I actually want a richer color so I'm not going to use this brush I'm going to leave it there and take uh, a brush that doesn't have any white paint on because the white paint tends to give a chalkiness to to your painting so I'm going to mix my purple from here without the the sort of the history of of that white paint sitting on it to get a more chalky, quite a, a less chalky color, more pure purple. And I'm going to now use it to draw in the shapes into this. Finding that shape there, finding it here. And where's the hat? It curves again. The paint is very wet. It will dry as we work, being acrylic. One of the big benefits of acrylic I know one can buy um, additions to make your acrylic paint uh, dry a little bit slower. Um, and you see I work um, in different places, I don't just work in one place. So I will have a bit of work here and there so that my painting sort of rises out of the field that I can see where it is. This hat the shape is more there and there's quite a bit of darkness that I see here. So once again working with the flatness, it's very similar to when I worked with a, with a charcoal, um, working with the shapes and finding those shapes. And then there's quite a bit of shadow here. And I'm following the weave of the hat to get that texture of the shape. And I want quite a dark color at the side there where that shadow is. So I'm going to layer it with paint on this side, find the edge of that hat. Just push that back a bit. And now the other thing that I see is quite a bit of the darkness that's in this blue here. And I can start drawing that in. Drawing that in here. And you can at this stage even leave your painting for a while so that it, it, it dries a bit more. And this is also for me one of the benefits of working in various pl places, uh, you know, of, of the painting is so that it can start drying. Okay, now um, you just work a bit more darkness into this off part here. And maybe a little bit of shadow, so I'm mixing it, I'm aware that it's mixing into the um, into the wet paint that's lying and I deliberately made it wet because I knew I was going to paint a bit of shadow here and it paints a very nice light shadow on this side. You can see that highlight there but I'm not just going to leave that there. Okay so we'll leave it at that. Now I'm going to go back to my brighter colors. So once again if you've done your ground, so the entire sheet is covered with paint. And if you've done your ground, you want to observe. You can even at this stage ask your learners to go and put the ground so that we can see, can we start seeing the hat in the background? 
and they have to discuss it. We know it's quite a clumsy hat. We have to push it in place back and forth. But we have the feeling of the hat in space. And we understand with the negative spaces, etc. So um, after you had a discussion, looked at the, the easy thing is at this stage, you don't have a lot of detail. If your hat is completely skew and awkward, you can easily correct it because you're working with your, you haven't spent three hours painstakingly putting little dots in to get another area in. So it's a really nice way. So I'm going to shift to thinner brushes now and, um, and bring in the lighter colors, uh, which work with brighter orange. We get some of the red. So now I'm going to just use brush strokes, building that up, building this up. And I also see that movement. I pick up on the movement of the weave and I do drag it into these areas to start explaining where, how this hat is made. Still using lines to explain that. I can maybe go even lighter. Um, yellow, red, um, I think other yellow is hiding at the back here. So I would like to have quite a bright yellow to bring parts of it forward and I'll mix some white in it now as well. So I know the hat is overall um, more of a rust colors, but I'm going to use my knowledge of color to, I know yellow moves forward, so I will add some yellow on this side because it immediately pushes, it's quite a nice warm rich buttery yellow. It has been intermixed a bit. I'm using this buttery yellow to just start speaking about the shape and mm, maybe we need a more that is enough. Yeah, I think that is enough. I'll add a bit more white there because I would like to have a little bit of a grayer color coming through. So we add some white. I don't want to use the white out of the tube. Mix it in and I can start picking up the little bits of light, catching the edge. And I will also pick up some of these cutting into the shadow. And these lines moving across here, allowing the paint to interact with each other. I'd like a much brighter orange on that side. So let's use another brush. Watch this one a bit. Everything is getting quite messy at some stage. It's sometimes worthwhile in the middle of your painting to just clean those brushes and get fresh, clean water so that the mess can be controlled. Everything becomes one grey jam eventually if you don't wash up in between. So I'm going to, I want an uh, intense orange and I'm going to pick up some of that red and place it in there because I want to find the shape of this hat. It lies there and I want to find it building up that direction. We'll fix that now. Um, and with a rich red. So this, this hat has a very particular weave and I'm trying to build onto the weave in my directions that I'm painting. So at this stage I'm working quite wet in wet and I'm just working with my light and dark colors. Bringing some of that rich color in there. There's a light quality here where that hat is and um, some blending. So your blending can be just dragging the one into the other for a soft blending. It's also quite nice if you use for blending another brush and it's totally clean so the paint sits there so it's easy for me with a clean brush to do the soft blending by just manipulating the paint and mixing it on my board. So instead of worrying about mixing it with adding, I, I mix it while just pushing the colors around. Okay, so that's just about blending and using a clean brush. We are going to go to a dark color again. I just want to hold this on here and get some drawing qualities. Ew, this brush is not very good. <laughs> Let's go 
a little bit softer. So in the pack that I'm working with, the, the darkest color is basically the mix of blue and red, and I use it then for my lines. So I'm, I want to go to a slightly drier quality to start drawing in dark lines. So I use it not only for its color, I use it for its darkness. Um, and I want to redefine that line of the hat and uh, that line there. So I go back to drawing. I've used a lot of lines in, um, in building the shape up, but I need, to find, I need to have my drawing fixed because the shape, so I literally push the shapes back to, to a place where I feel they describe the forms. With this brush, it's um, as an old brush and it scrapes into the paint. We call that the um, scraffito. So you can actually use that and not think it's just awful. It is actually something that is used. You can also use the back of your brush to scratch into a scraffito and to mimic the texture of the hat and the weave of the hat. So that's another technique you can use. So let's use some of these lines to also just find the lines of the hat and the way it lies on here and the way it goes around and up, around and up here, yeah, drawing into it. I'm finding the darkness here again, there's much darker qualities. So we just keep on painting it up until that, that object surface. Ideal, you paint sort of two days or three days. Your surface that you get, and then when it's dry, so you can put lasers on. Your first day is about finding the structure to, to be able for this hat to sit there as a, shall I say, as an object. So I'm working with some dark lines in here. They are quite feathery. But with the light lines afterwards, we can fix that featheriness. I'm just going to work into it like this and back in there and then in there again. So now I want to start pushing that back because I see that shape is really um, interfering with the hat shape and I'm going to correct my hat shape by pushing back. So I want to mix quite a light colour there and correct that shape. I see that ends there and all of that which is wrong, well according to from this angle, I'll correct it by simply painting over it. So I'm laying my paint on there and I want to define the edge of this again, nice sharp line. So now I can move over, I've got a much more subtle color and I can move this here on. I can move over that and I want to start picking up the texture of the cloth at the back, these sort of linear qualities in the cloth and I work, oops, just mix that in. I want to move over this, quite a free hand. This technique where you rub over and you see the bottom coming over, like the light over the dark, that's called scumbling. And um, a scumbling is often used li light over dark. So it still has that shadow in there, but I'm pushing it back by great slight gradations of, um, of, of tone. Um, just working on it lightly, lightly, lightly. And I'm going to take some here, add it here to get that shape. But what I see here, I'm going to use some scumbling over this shadow. So you can see I'm pushing it back with the scumbling. And there's a bit of a warmer tone coming through now. So that's already a second layer. We need light in this hat and we need much more light here. So I've got a bit of a pink there. So we we'll use this liquid white. So I need to mix it on the side until I get my color that I'm happy with. So this is very, if I hold my brush here, it's very, very pinky. And I could maybe use, I can test a bit, I could use a bit of that, but I want it to be quite a cold colour. This colour would actually work very well in the highlights of the hat here. So it might come in there. 
and it might come on the side of the band here, and it might come on the side of the hat there. Right, but I don't want too much of that in the front. Now I'm going to build up more icy, icy white with blue liquid paint. So I'm looking for a very cold, very cold blue to push this area forward. So here I'm intermixing those two colors. And what I see is I can use the ground color, which is still a little bit wet, and just to work over that color and get a nice painterly feel. Uh, I know it's just a piece of paper, but there is a, if I sweep the brush along, it gives me that smoothness of the paper. And so I observe what I see there, push my shadow in a little bit there. Um, the freedom with which I work, I think it's important because it doesn't, um, your kids don't have to be scared that it's wrong. Um, it is stuff that you push around. Um, I want to bring in white and I'm actually going to put a little bit of white on the canvas here just to really get this icy color. So I'll mix it on the canvas and I'll intermix it with scumbling marks, wet and wet, trying to find the smoothness and trying to bring out that sharp, sharp shadow on the, the other side. So even as a field of a very quiet field of, of color, there's all these variations that's built up that has a really nice painterly feel. And I'm going to bring a bit of that warm tones in the back and make that a bit lighter because the, um, the cloth has that feeling. Bring some lines in there and some creases in the cloth, play with that. some sharp lines moving in here and there may be some sharper lines moving in there and sharper lines moving in there and this could potentially move back quite a bit lighter just to get that block there so you can see that the space is not nothing the space the space lives with paint and mark and 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 the energy of that it gave me time to get this to dry a bit so we're going to go back to that again and mix up a little bit. Paint Okay. Okay, I want this to break a bit. So in the beginning when I worked on it, I laid quite a few textures over it and what happened with searching for texture and becoming another aspect of the hat gets lost, it's three dimensionality. And uh, what I'm doing now is I'm going over with a, sort of a more unified color, leaving some of those textures will shine through um, because I think they've dried a little bit. and. Um, so if I go over it lightly, I still have a bit of that at the bottom, but um, I can now correct my shape. I actually want to put a glaze over there, but it will only be dry enough in a day's time. So I'm just scumbling lightly over that. Um, and I'm going to go over this as well to unify my painting. Just pulling it all together. And I think our hat is more or less done for the day. <laughs> it needs one more layer of thin lines and what is ideal if one has a session is to work with transparent glazes because with thin washes that you build over something it really gives it richness. Um, so when this is dry what I might do is just later on put a few thin glazes and we can take a still photograph and see what those washes did to enliven it. Thank you very much.